Welcome to Mindshack True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And Marshall Powers. And today we're talking about morbid fascination and the nature of true crime and true crime popularity. As always, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications so you get updates. And allow your device to send you those updates. Make sure you have that setting taken care of. You could also like our Facebook page. Check us out. Twitter, Reddit, Patreon. And patrons do get priority if you have case requests or subject requests for us to cover. And you can also select which podcasters you want to cover which topic that you are requesting. So, Maxwell, when did you first uh, become interested in true crime? I don't really know, but... When you were a kid, were you kind of, like, fascinated with serial killers or crimes or grisly crimes? I mean, my my exposure to true crime kind of started with, with horror movies and serial killers and some of these documentaries, missing persons. I mean, it was so... As a child... Watching it as a child, it's kind of, it has a very scary effect on you. You, you don't want to go out alone. You know, there's, there's different situations. I mean, I do have a couple of uh, close call encounters I don't think I've uh, shared on the podcast yet. I don't know. I might save them for another podcast. But yeah, I've encountered some shady individuals as a child, and I had a couple of close calls. I don't know if they were serial killers, but they were definitely shady individuals looking to abduct a child. So... Just watching these movies and documentaries, it's it's this this bizarre curiosity. It's not that it's it's obviously not pleasant information. It's not like watching a pleasant TV show or a comedy or even an action movie. It's uh it's very dark subject matter. It's exploring the dark side of humanity. What what, what, what was, did that draw you in at some point, or or was kind of uh. Or it was just kind of always in the background, just from news reports, or, or what? What is your uh, exposure or introduction to grisly crime? Um, I guess for most people, uh, well, for me at least, I'm trying to think back as far as I can. But the first like kind of murder, serial murder, serial murder movie, it wasn't a documentary; it was a movie. Uh, this dude ran around naked with a knife and just killed people. Is that American Psycho? What are you talking about? That could be it. I don't know, but it was in the eighties. Oh, that American. Yeah, that was an American Psycho then. No, well, I think American Psycho was remade. That might be. An, it might. Have oh, been was American it? I Psycho. didn't even. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that. I think American I, Psycho. I know, I know for a fact that I saw a fucking movie with this dude with a surgical glove and and a freaking knife, and he's running on the streets. You know, you know, these police lights chasing him and he's, you know, freaking killing people and shit. But you don't remember did, the name? You don't remember the name of the movie? I don't fucking know, but it sounds like American Psycho. Huh. Yeah, no, American Psycho, the only scene like that I remember, I think he had a, ch- did he have a chainsaw and he was chasing somebody in a stairwell? I don't know. I saw the movie when it first came out. That was a while ago. I don't really remember it, it too well. It, it, you know, you know what's weird about that movie? That, that guy that. I guess I'm mixing it up in my brain. The guy that acted in the uh, the modern American Psycho, Christian Bale. Con- yeah, Christian Bale looks exactly like that in the '80s, like that guy. I don't know. It just Man, we can't trust. Him. Th- if we've learned anything on Mind Shock, it's that we can't trust Maxwell Powers' memory. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, in terms of in well, terms anyway, of anyway, <laughs> anyway, that I I feel I think I th- I'm thinking that's the first. Um, well, not really, because I did see Psycho, you know, Psycho, the, the classic. Yes, yes. So I saw sure. that. Um, but did you watch the news? Did you watch the news when you were a kid? Um, I mean, I, watched, sure. I remember watching America's Most Wanted, and it was always so scary just that there are these real oh, life. Yeah, you know what? You know what? That, could, that could be my first exposure to true crime, America's Most Wanted. Yeah, that so was a lot like, of people. That, that was a lot of people's. And it's so scary because it's not a movie. It's real life. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was as yeah, a you know, child. I'm guessing. I'm. I'm guessing that would be it. I guess. I guess it started from movies, so you get intrigued by like, damn, why, like, making movies, of people killing people, and then America's uh, Most Wanted. They kind of show the real life of what the what movies you've seen. So the, I think they're the. You know, they they went along with the movies. I guess to. You know capture. what I find? I think what I find interesting is. I think it's a lot about, it's on the nurture side of it, where most uh, people in Western countries that watch the news, 
they have this morbid fascination, this morbid curiosity regarding true crime, serial killers, all these things. I think at least partially due to the media and what they saw as a kid, especially with, you know, on the news, you're always, uh, it's always sensationalized with all this uh, serial killer on the loose and all these movies that kind of go off of that. And well, that, well, nowadays it's mostly like school shootings and like mass shootings. And I, I kind of, um, I, I, I still see it in my like Apple news feed because it like, I don't read into it a lot of times, but like it does come up, you know, this, I think it was recent someone, I, I forgot what state, but there was another shooting. And I didn't read into it though. Yeah, I don't. There was there was a couple shootings recently, but yeah, I, I try not to watch the news too much. It's it's very depressing. <laughs> but yeah. in true crime, I guess that kind of sets it up because when you're a kid and you're you, you're exposed to this information, you know all the missing children, uh, kidnapped people, people getting killed. There's just a lot of violent crime. And why do you think that the genre itself has? just gained so much popularity. I mean, true crime podcasts are the the top or one of the top genres for podcasts. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. Well, I'm, yeah. Huh. Yeah, there's there's a ton of true crime, true crime podcasts. Obviously, none are as good as Mind Shock. Obviously, <laughs> none run the gauntlet of logical fallacies and critical thinking and deductive reasoning the way that we go over all our cases as well as other subjects, the paranormal conspiracy. So obviously none of the other podcasts are as good as Mindshock or as unique as Mindshock, but there are quite a few podcasts out there covering different cases. There's podcasts that cover one case only, and they run several seasons. They go deep into a single case. And there's other podcasts that cover many other cases, but some of them are kind of weird. Like one of them, some, called, of, them, some of them are high, are high end, like uh, the serial. Um, serial? I think, yeah. I think it's called, yeah, serial. That was... Yeah, that, that was, was really pretty good. good. I, I, yeah, I followed like that one pot, uh, podcast story or um, whatever you call it. Um, that was really uh, high end production because they the edit was insane. There was music that uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. <laughs> oh, come on, we got music on mine, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning uh, uh, rave music. Yeah, once uh, well, once we get a little bigger, we'll we'll upgrade our mics and uh, get a, get a full studio and, and all that jazz. But uh, in the meantime, we'll just we'll just continue uh, covering with with truth and logic above all else and objectivity. But yeah, the the pot the genre of true crime. I mean, some of the some of them are kind of like it seems like they cater to strange people. For example, I mean, I think there's one podcast called Murder and Martinis where they kind of uh, make a big show about drinking martinis and talking about murder. Like, I mean, I don't know if I was if I was a member, if, if I was a family member of someone gone missing, I'm not sure that would be my go to podcast. I don't know. It's almost I don't want to say it makes light of it, but it's just it's almost putting it in a pure. Entertainment well, I could, fashion. I, well, I could see I could see it as um, I, I think. It's, it's actually not bad. It's not a bad name because Martine, well, it's, a, it's alliteration first off, so it's memorable. So Martine and Murder. Is that, is that what it's called? It's, I think or it's bad. called Murder and Martinis or Martinis and Murder. Murder and Martinis. Like... So it's an alliteration, so it's, it's like it's memorable and stuff. But uh, uh, I can see how the image of Martine and Murder, um, you know, you get that picture at a bar and you're just kind of like letting the letting Well, I think the, I, the I, murder I topic came up. Well, I so think, that's... well, from what I saw about it, I saw some photo on Twitter about it. It's that it's I, what I'm guessing are the hosts. They're kind of like just sipping martinis and laughing. So it's like an entertainment vibe. So it's not just the name. Mm. It's kind of like the presentation. Well, it depends, of on, it. depends on how you really approach it. Because sometimes like some names are like really catchy. But when you get to the content, it's like totally the opposite. It's almost like they're playing. Yeah, I know. I just said that. I, they... I just said that. I said it's oh, not just the I name. The photo, the visuals were of people laughing and drinking martinis as if. It's an entertainment thing. You know, you're going over people. I mean, obviously... Yeah, but, the, eating, but, yeah, but is the content like that or no? I actually... I haven't listened to too much of it. I saw a brief uh, intro. So you, and, so you can't tell if you're doing if you're telling the same thing as I did. They I'm could talking be, about they, the visual. Yeah, but we moved on from just the name. I was. I said it was the visual presentation. Was It, it wasn't just the name. Because the name, I agree. Not, yeah, I don't I'm think inter, the name I'm is... Inter, I'm interested in the content thing. now. Like, like whether they're like... Uh, 
I, I, I'm guessing, I'm honestly, guessing it's quite serious. Honestly, no, honestly, I, I turned it off after about a minute. I think those guys were on the Missing Maura Murray podcast, I think, the host. Uh, and they were just, uh, the vibe kind of matched what I saw on Twitter. To be fair, I haven't listened to a full podcast, so maybe they're not really like that for the full show. But yeah. everything seemed, it, it, the name, the visual presentation, and the very brief snippet that I heard, they all matched what I'm saying. That it was Which kind of a just for entertainment type setup. Uh, uh, I see. Hmm. And that was I was bringing to my bringing to my next point. Like for example, some of these crime conventions, like CrimeCon, it seems like the one aspect of it, just one aspect. I'm not talking about the aspect that's for the families, maintaining awareness and uh, trying to get help get these keep these cases in the public eye and get them solved and bring uh, closure to the families. I'm not talking about that. Obviously, that's great. That's why we cover true crime cases. That's why most people do. That's what 90% probably of most podcasts and documentaries do. But there's a certain aspect to it. For example, someone was telling me that at CrimeCon, they even had some kind of booth or, or presentation or show where for entertainment, people would sit in a chair, get tied up, and they would be playing uh, the audio of a serial killer torturing somebody. So it's kind of like for fun. They got to so keep in mind this isn't some kind of Halloween show. Uh, that's this that, is it's it's a weird it's kind of creepy in a way, but like I I uh, that's weird. Uh, I think yeah. they're just trying to get you to experience what it's like. I guess I don't know. Uh, yeah, but the of, whole kind ki- like it's a little different when it's Halloween and it's all about scaring. But if you're at a crime convention with true crime, I mean, we're talking about people that have lost family members, people that have had family members' children abducted and killed. They have this kind of display. I think it's just poor taste. I mean, just my opinion, uh, of course. Well, I, I well, uh, I, okay. I think I can see playing this way. I mean, if you can, you can make it serious, like a freaking some some psychologist in a lab coat and shit, and trying to get you to experience what it's like, so you know, I don't know. I can see that working. But if it's like a fucking like a booth with a company name on a T-shirt and fucking this is the scary chair uh uh ride. And you're you're dressed in a monster suit or something, and well, there's that uh, aspect. It's like some people use true crime as entertainment. Uh, so obviously, there's a certain morbid fascination with crime in general, with serial killers. Like, what makes people evil, or what what makes this dark side of humanity occur? And it's around us. You can't deny. I, I can see, I can see I can see a booth of like let's say um like if you want it's, if you like to, like the, when people who don't get the idea of uh, what do you call that when you uh, when you go along with your criminal? What do you call that again? Stockholm when syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, if you if you're the type of person like you don't know about it and uh, you, and you say you like, well, I wouldn't act like that, and then they have an experimental like lab thing, and then you go in it, and then you like if you set you're it reaching, up, well, you're reaching you're reaching pretty hard, Maxwell. You're you're, you're really uh, you're really going with these uh, devil's advocate. Uh, examples. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, if it's a freaking true crime, like, like to like a psychologist who wants to explain what Stockholm syndrome is, he can set up a system where a person can go in 30 minutes and you know sign all these forms. You know. Yeah, I think Stockholm Stockholm syndrome is actually kind of rare. In most of the cases we've covered and we've looked at, it seems like St- Stockholm syndrome. There's really not a lot. I mean, I suppose the really really long term captives, but. Uh, it might be more prevalent, but I guess we should probably do a dedicated episode on Stockholm syndrome. But I thought, wait, wait, wait. I thought like what? I don't understand why you're saying rare because I thought it was like the default of victims to fall into that. I thought like why? Why do you say rare? It's for, it's really rare. I mean, look at all these cases where after a year or two, someone escaped from their captor, or they were trying to escape. They were trying to slip messages out. They want to be rescued. The Stockholm syndrome is pretty rare. I haven't seen that many cases of Stockholm syndrome. I mean, I'm sure there's a correlation with the amount of time that they've been held captive. Because yeah, yeah, like like three years would probably set in the Stockholm syndrome. I guess. I guess like three weeks is not enough or something. Yeah, most of uh, well, what about the? Uh, I mean, there there was a couple cases where especially with ten, age too, like like age probably has a lot to do. There with was a couple period. cases. There was a couple cases, ten, twenty years even in captivity, where they just wanted to escape. I mean, there were escape attempts, and then they couldn't escape. Wait, do, do you remember that event? Um, this uh, 
this was recently made uh, maybe i think five years ago like this girl escaped from the basement and like yeah went to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you remember that he's locked on, he knocked on the um um well she was white and then <laughs> and then the the neighbor was black and he was like like you know screaming and yelling help me help me and then he the guy was interviewed afterwards and he was like yo if a white girl <laughs> it was pretty funny but if a white girl like asking like a uh, black dude um uh for help there's something wrong <laughs> i don't, know. I don't remember that i don't remember that interview but, but... He, like yeah um a friend actually was like man he was so funny that he didn't start he needed to start his uh, own show but i don't know you guys can look that up but yeah so no i think it's i think it's pretty rare i i i mean i don't think that that's even close to the default so anyway regardless of that i i think yeah you're reaching kind of far to try to justify some of this but uh i don't know maybe people agree with you i don't know i think it's i think it's mostly in poor taste but um everybody's got a different sense of humor so and everybody's got a different uh what appeals to them entertainment wise but well, I wasn't I wasn't defending. I'm just saying like it depends on what the presentation was. I mean, if the presentation was like a ride, like a freaking circus ride, then it's been poor taste. But if it's the presentation is like this, like the psychology of whatever Stockholm syndrome or the psychology. Of I would torture. still say that's in poor taste if it's if if you need a subject. So it's still kind of set up like a ride or experiment with with someone having to deal with very traumatic things. Yeah, I guess, and yeah, I, guess, I, agree. I agree with you on that, because, like, especially that freaking There's time, family, well, there's family like a, members, not like a, there's family like members of victims walking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's yeah, why yeah, I think yeah, you that, reach- that is That is kind of messed up, because, like, if you, yeah, that's messed up. Because, like, you know, you've, you've imagined every scenario about what happened to your child, and yeah. now you're seeing, well, now you're seeing a freaking, the venue yeah, is the no, wrong I, venue. I exactly, I'm just kind of, like, taking all these uh uh perspectives i don't know playing devil's advocate <laughs> uh, sort of i guess exactly like that but uh anyway <laughs> so the uh yeah so we're, we're like do you feel like true crime has risen in popularity because i personally i don't i don't i don't notice um i just i just i guess because i'm i'm in one <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i guess i don't know i yeah, it's, I mean, there's entire networks now dedicated to true crime. I mean, I mean, I thought I thought it stayed the same because America's Most Wanted. Now we have my yeah, but show those are show. There's a shows now. There's entire networks well, and channels. Uh, well, well, also, I mean, it's not entirely because of the genre, but it's because of the uh, the media of podcasting and blogging and all well, that well, stuff. Now, for the third time, I've been trying to say the same thing. It's entire channels on TV now are dedicated to true crime. So that has nothing to do with podcasting or, I mean, if anything, it's in spite of it because yeah. you have alternative, alternative media. Well, I don't know. I'm sure there's some, there's some like metrics out there that, that show the rise of true crime or whatever. Well, sure. if there weren't entire channels dedicated to true crime before and there are now, wouldn't you say that's a rise in popularity? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't. Uh, sure that it was, you know. Well, I just mentioned it but, three times. Yeah, but what channels are they? What what are, what are they called? Uh, Discovery ID now. I, th- I believe that's all true crime. Oxygen Network has shifted. Ah, uh, damn, Ox- really? Uh, or at least maybe there's two Oxygen Networks. I don't know. I don't or- know, like, cause cause TV is dying. So I guess like I'm thinking maybe these are on Hulu and Netflix and shit like that. No, on TV. Actually, you know, they, they do have um, dedicated series on Netflix on, on just true crime. So, like, the Bundy tapes and stuff, so. Yeah, there's a ton. I mean, you got it. I mean, HBO always had true crime shows, yeah. Netflix is big, but, uh, yeah, no, it seems like it's it's rising in popularity. And one of the, man, it's kind of hard to do the podcast when you keep playing devil's advocate. Like, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to move <laughs> forward, like. Like I'm trying to say, like okay, okay, move kinda, on, move on to your next thing. What is it? like? Uh, I accept that the, the reasons the, we're discussing the reasons why uh, they're kind of they're becoming like. Do you really think the average person on the street is that much more morbid than okay, they were? Okay, okay, so so years let's ago? let's explain why. I mean, it's kind of like uh, the the independent media system that we have. Well, did you hear my last question? Uh, no, I forgot. Got to pay attention, man. I said, do you think the average person on the street is more morbid? in general now today than 10 20 years ago um more of it as a negative about 
the world or no morbid as in oh i gotta check out the bundy tapes or like uh, or or just intimate knowledge of ted bundy serial killers like they're just more familiar with it whereas 10 20 years ago they'd be like oh yeah serial killers exist but i don't really want to think about that i'm not gonna go watch yeah. i'm not gonna go binge watch a series on a serial killer that's dark yeah. i want to i want to watch some yeah, comedy well, i know a few people like that they just can't um uh they'll they'll watch a fiction you know story but they they can't watch true crime because it's just too it's just too much for them because it's real <laughs> they can't yeah i mean when i before doing the podcast and the previous years before doing the mind shock true crime podcast yeah i i normally avoided it but what's weird is every now and then the mystery aspect like the puzzle solving mystery it's so mysterious i mean one of the reasons unsolved mysteries was so was so popular like everything aliens bigfoot whatever the paranormal phenomena because you don't really know and that mystery there's something so appealing about mystery so of course that's present in true crime as well so every now and then there'd be some really mysterious cases like obviously more that's yeah, one of the I would most say, I would say, yeah i would say like a, for that kind of personality the the uh, the problem solving type personality i mean that that gets to true crime. Yeah, but even aside from like, that, just like in logic, general, logicians and you know. But even aside from that, in general, just the the mystery of it, I think there's some crossover appeal. For example, Maura Murray on the Oxygen Show that did pretty well, and people that weren't even really into true crime. Yeah, they don't, weren't into yeah that. You're, you're you're right. That's cool. Um, yeah, people don't like the question. Um, yeah, they want to know. People not know. Yeah, know. They, they, they don't like not knowing, so they, they yeah. have to research it. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, and I, I think that gives true crime a lot of its popularity. But on the darker side, where all the details are known, there's a certain group of people, they're just fascinated with serial killers. I mean, look at the people that the, uh, I don't know, what do they call them? Do they call them serial killer groupies, I guess? They write to serial killers in prison. They want to marry them, and they do. Like, that's a different kind of morbid curiosity or morbid fascination. Wow, wow that is weird. Yeah, the woman who thinks... So, so, you're, so, you're saying, so you're saying it's not even like a, like a Stephen Avery situation where they think he's innocent. They, oh, no, these, no. They, well, these you didn't people know about actually this? believe. No, you didn't know about actually, this? Not really, but... No, they, they know actually, they're guilty. They know they're guilty. I mean, they have their crimes photographed. Yeah. I mean, they're just groupies. Now, what's weird is I always thought those people were just crazy, insane, and evil. But here's the thing. They're not. It's uh yeah, they're, well they're some of them people some of them some of them are not. Well if you stop interrupting me, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to kill anybody, they don't want to hurt anybody themselves. They just think it's cool, or like the serial killer is like he's like the bad boy. Now they don't want him to kill anybody else. They don't want to be involved in it. I mean, I'm sure some of them do, but a certain percentage of groupies, I'd probably even say the majority. They just think it's cool. It's like he's a celebrity serial killer. They think he's so, a nice so guy. So it's like it's like so it's like the taking the extreme of like that principle that uh, women want to turn alpha males into beta males, <laughs> and just. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't say like, like that. They want to they want to tame the 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 craziest lions and stuff. So I mean. I'm not going to go into that psychological aspect of it. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I uh, what I saw. And if you stop interrupting me, I can finish what I saw. And then you can give your opinion on it. Okay. So they kind of, they, they seem to think that the guy's just really cool. And they don't even necessarily make excuses for the murders. Like, I haven't even seen them say, oh, well, they deserved it. No. They're like, oh, the guy had a troubled life. He might have killed some people, but he seems like a nice guy. I want to marry him. So that's that's the attitude of some of these groupies where it's just this morbid fascination with this guy's a serial killer, but they want to go out with him anyway. They want to marry him anyway. And some of them do. And some of them actually, I don't know if they continue killing people, but the murderers, the, the serial killers that get out, whether they get out on a technicality or or whatever, and they don't kill again, there's cases where they live relatively happily with the groupie for however long. Then maybe they kill again or get arrested on something else. But there's a certain span of time where they're happy together. And it's, it's I mean, what kind of morbid fascination does a person have to have to be fascinated to this level of with serial killers? Now, that has nothing to do with mystery. That has nothing to do with whether they're innocent or guilty. That's just someone... That's just a certain percentage of humans that are just fascinated with other humans that can just take lives. 
So that's pretty much what I've seen with certain groupies. You didn't know about this? Nah. Really? You didn't know about serial killer groupies? Nah. Wow, man. Maxwell lives under a rock on Mars. Well, now that you know, what do you think about it? Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> you never want to talk when I ask questions. You only want to interrupt when I'm talking. <laughs> well, I don't know what to think about. I mean, there's, they're like, they're like, they're intrigued. I guess they're bored. They're intrigued by a murderer, and they wanna, they want, they want to change people. Like, it's the biggest. Women look at men as projects, right? So they they want to go out and then change them for their families and shit. So they look at the serial murderer as the epitome of projects. I mean, I, I, I mean. I wouldn't, I mean, maybe a certain percentage, but I wouldn't say that from what I've seen. That From what I've I'm seen, sure, I'm sure the women will comment on this video and be like, yo, yeah, Maxwell's well, right. They, uh, well, there's a lot, I mean, men as projects and shit. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. some, I'm sure some but do, I would, but I mean, I wouldn't, but I wouldn't go with a murderer because that's too much of a big project for me. Are you done? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that at all because you're generalizing so much. I'm sure there's a certain percentage, I don't know about big or small. And then there's another certain percentage where women are – there's certain women that they they want the cool guy that's not a project. They don't want to have to deal with someone they're going to have to fix. They think that he's the coolest guy in the world and they want to be with him. That's the whole bad boy appeal. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure there's all different types of people. But I, for someone who didn't know about serial killer groupies, you seem to have ascribed a gigantic generalization to all <laughs> of them in, in within within mere well, minutes I wasn't, of finding out I mean, about I – wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't like – um, I didn't mean to generalize. I'm just saying, like that's the psychology behind it. I mean, but how would you know that that's the psychology? I, I don't fucking know. I'm just guessing because you asked me. Like, well, you probably you said, shouldn't start. You said, well, starting because you said, with, you said no. I have no responses. I'm like, oh, I guess. This. Starting, then, so. starting. Well, you actually interrupted me while I was talking with this one. You actually said they probably just want a project, and it's the ultimate project. You you started with that. You didn't say maybe. Yeah, it's, you... a it's a generalization, so it's false. I mean, it's not like I'm not. I'm not stating that it's. It's not. I'm not stating that this is fact. This is the psychological principle that's been researched. Well, when you start, when you start a comment with "they probably," it seems like yeah. you are. <laughs> okay, so I should say they they probably not or or they. <laughs> you go from probably to probably not this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they, I should say they probably not. They're probably not thinking about that. All right. Well, They're getting this, about, getting this probably podcast, not likely to think of them as projects. <laughs> getting this podcast back on track, the uh, the fascination aspect of it, because it is you, you you probably you probably are right about the aspect where they're bored. Because if they weren't bored and they were living an exciting life with exciting men in it, and they had their fa they were doing whatever they wanted to do, why the heck would they be writing a serial killer in prison? I mean, that's a good point there. It probably is that boredom probably has a lot to do with it, but uh, across the board, though, let's let's move on from the serial killers and the groupies. But people in general seem to always be fascinated by crime, violence, murders, because look at how look at the history of newspaper and how crimes are reported. Like even in Jack the Ripper, we have a very very good Jack the Ripper series. If you haven't checked that out, check that out. But that was kind of the rise of sensationalist journalism within true crime. I mean, that might have been one of the first. It, it wasn't the first case. I mean, there was a couple beforehand, even possibly almost 100 years before Jack the Ripper, but which was 1888 was Jack the Ripper. But Jack the Ripper was like the big one because by then there were more newspapers. There was more sensationalism. So it, it was kind of it's kind of interesting to go back and see the history of sensationalism in newspapers regarding the reporting of true crime. Jack the Ripper strikes again. It's like they want to get your attention. They want to drag your emotions into it. They almost want to breed this fear, this uh, this fear culture around it, not just to drum up interest and sell more newspapers, which is obviously part of it, but it's almost like, like everything's an attention grab, like all different types of advertising for different types of companies. It, it almost seems like true crime has become its own attention grab and people become fascinated. I mean, there's big cases. Obviously, OJ was a big one. I mean, you had, uh, what was it, Casey Anthony, that big case. There was Scott Peterson, that was a big case. There's all, And then Chris Watts was the latest big case. People are just fascinated with people killing, people killing their family, people with killing random people, serial killers. What do you think is the root cause of that fascination that kind of feeds this true crime genre? 
Um, I don't really know. No musings about psychology, Maxwell? Can you repeat the question again? <laughs> ah, Maxwell Army. What do you think is the psychology behind this interest in true crime? Like, look at the look at these recent cases in the news. You remember Chris Watts? He snapped and killed his family. I mean, it was all over the news. But there seems to be a lot of interest in some of these bigger cases. I, sometimes I forget you live under a rock on Mars. But, yeah, some of these big cases. Okay, O.J. Simpson. You remember that one. There was so yeah, much yeah. interest in this. That one was slightly different because it was a popular figure. O.J. was, you know, a celebrity, football player, movie actor. But in some of these other cases, Chris Watts was nobody. Scott Peterson was nobody. I mean, there are some of these big cases where this person is not a celebrity, but it's he becomes like a pop culture celebrity, true crime celebrity, basically. I mean, he gets a ton of letters in prison, and people just follow the case. A lot of people follow the case. What do you think is the psychology behind this interest in these people who just randomly kill their family or serial killers? Like, what, what is behind the interest? What causes this morbid fascination? Uh. I don't know. I think figuring out the figuring out the shock, like, like for themselves, like, would I ever kill my own family? Because like that's kind of weird. Because I love my family, that kind of thing. What would drive someone to kill their family? So they try to figure that out. Because I don't want to be in the same position. Because I don't want to kill my own family. That kind of shit. Well, that's pretty dark. That led me to another thought. That's that's pretty good insight. I hadn't thought about that. That's a very good insight because what if deep in the in the darkest part of their psyche, they think they might be capable of it as well. So that's why they're so intrigued. It's kind of yeah, like every, everybody's like, got a like, dark it's like, side. It's like, it's like unconsciously um, exploring their unconscious. Yeah, because everybody has a dark side. That is a good point. The, the dark side of human nature. That is a very good insight, Maxwell. That is a very good insight. I think that might have a lot to do with it. And people's fascination with serial killers in general, kind of thinking, what, could I, what would I ever, everybody likes to think they wouldn't be able to be capable of it. But, you know, a small part of your brain might be thinking, man, all humans might be capable of this. So once you realize that, yeah, I mean, put it, it, put it, put it, in a, put it in a serious position. So I think that's probably one of the reasons, like, what are, what caused this person to, like, if it's like purely, um, um, somehow brain triggered or something like they want to figure that out they want to rule that out or something or they want to rule out the other reasons which are like stress stress factors relationship cheating that kind of thing like yeah or, yeah for or, sure or, yeah and so, if you haven't I don't know, they want they, you know, they want they just want to figure it out if you haven't checked out our the science of evil nature versus nurture a podcast we did on what causes an individual to become evil so to, to say evil, serial killers or people that snap, the whole nature versus nurture debate, we go over that on that podcast. But yeah, that's a good point because if people really don't know what they're capable of, it's a lot easier to believe, oh, this human is just a monster. This serial killer is just a monster. I'll never be like that. But if you have that little bit of doubt in your mind, you don't even realize it if it's subconscious. Just exploring the nature of what humans are capable of that that is a morbid fascination and that might be the reason people might think could you ever be driven to this in are there circumstances that are that bad that could ever drive you to do this that that's creepy to think about because i'm sure most of the listen most listeners out there they're going to say yeah like you said they love their family they're never going to kill their family like how could this happen it's almost like a disbelief so it's kind of like you know, it's almost like watching an accident on the road. Like, you don't want to look at it, but you can't help but look at it. Do you think that's why certain people follow true crime? It's it's not even that they necessarily want to. It's just, like, they can't help but to. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, a good, that's a good analogy with the accident. Like, they don't want to look at dead people, but they kind of <laughs> they kind of turn their necks. <laughs> well, for me, yeah, well, for me... That's that's one that's one part of true crime. I I don't go down that route. I don't do autopsy photos. I don't do dead body photos. I don't want to see the crime scene photos unless the body's not there. <laughs> that's well, just for, for, well for for me. Uh, I think for most people, like when I look at an accident, like I I kind of see like. Uh, how much damage there was like i look at the cars I, I, and i try to figure out what causes 
what was the accident like if I were to replay it in my mind. So this was a head like this was a head to head collision. This this guy made a left turn. You can figure it out. I mean, like depending on yeah. the damage of the car. Like, oh, uh, this guy made a left turn too early, or the guy didn't see him, or something. And then you see the 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 people sitting on the curb with ice on their head and that kind of thing. Like, just so you try, yeah. try to figure out which car they were in. The um, you know. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. People kind of, yeah, you want to almost make sense of it. When something is so senseless, it's, I think it's human nature to try to make sense of it. So then they're hooked. They're hooked on these true crime cases, these serial killers, and they watch these serial killer interviews. But yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't go that far. I'm not, I'm not into the grisly aspect. I don't want to see any people getting killed. I don't want to see the aftermath of people getting killed. For me, it's mostly the mystery side of it. And of course, anything done to bring awareness to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. And I think that's, you know, that's another aspect we need to move on to right now. If you understand the circumstances, the psyche, I mean, I think all people want to prevent any kind of sense, well, good people <laughs> want to prevent any kind of senseless crimes, kidnappings, murders. So it's almost like you're watching these shows or programs to try to understand how this could have happened and to take precautions to prevent it. Because I think even in the 60s and 70s, I don't think true crime was that popular. You know, kids played out on the streets without supervision. I mean, even even as recent as probably the 90s, there wasn't this aura of fear, this culture of fear and fear mongering where anybody could be kicked up at any time, even though that was true in the 70s. I mean, some of these cases are really, really heartbreaking. You know, kids are just riding a bike a block from their house and some guy pulls them into a van. So now you want to learn, you know, a certain side of it. Humans, I think, want to learn how this situation could have happened and then just take more precautions because awareness, you know, knowledge is power and being aware of how some of these criminals operate and how some of these situations unfolded you know, that, that could help some people be more careful in their lives. Do you think that has something to do with it? Um, There's a lot of talk there, but <laughs> like, can you sum up what? <laughs> oh, Maxwell Army. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was following, but like... One of the aspects of people's fascination with true crime, I think, is to understand how situations unfold and how certain uh, individuals behave to protect themselves and their families and kind of move society in a direction where more precautions are taken. So, oh yeah, yeah. That, oh definitely. Yeah. That's, oh yeah, that's a, actually that's a that's a good point. Like that's that's a big like uh, that's a big aspect of the interest. Like yeah. they're trying to they're trying to um, they're trying to learn from this to make sure event, yeah to make sure that it doesn't happen. To yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Like uh, how to avoid murderers. And, how to, yeah, um, just even, warning signs. Even like, yeah, warning, warning signs, signs. Of, like, behaviors. Like, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, like, co-workers who act kind of similar to that. Yeah. And then, 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 Profiling. then, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also, just the other thing I said is, well, like. Also, 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 especially, like, since the, the fact is that most uh, murders are done by people you know, so. <laughs> Yes, but the other aspect of what I was saying was, you know, kids playing in the streets alone. When you're more aware, you watch a lot of true crime shows, you're probably not going to let your kids do that. You know, you're going to you're going to want adult supervision at all times. You're not going to, you know, go ride your bike to your friend's house and you never see them again. I think I mean, it, it's weird. You don't want to be too paranoid to the point where you can't live your life. But I think being aware of situations where this could happen and I think the, the other aspect of it is, I think a certain part of it is human. You know, that, that's, wait, hold on. Let me interrupt you because that, that kind of reminds me like how, how I grew up and stuff because I was always alone by like in, in streets that are deserted and stuff. Like, man, I could have been the perfect victim, dude. <laughs> I actually had a run-in. When I was a kid, I had, I had a run-in with a guy that tried to get me in his car. Oh, shit. What did he say? I never told you this story, Maxwell. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, I think, maybe, I, want to save it. I think I want to save it for a different podcast. But uh, uh, I, well, what's funny is I wasn't that little. I mean, not funny, but uh, I wasn't that little. So I was a little bit, uh, I was a little bit, I was an older kid and I wasn't that small. I was, I was athletic. So I was actually quite shocked that he would even try to pull that off because in my brain, I was like, I think I could take this guy. <laughs> uh, uh. And I had one other encounter at a rest area 
when I was much younger. And that was uh, that one was really creepy. I got a really bad vibe from this guy that was just like following people into bathrooms and stuff. Oh shit! And uh, yeah, it was the middle. It was super late. I mean, luckily, my parents were there, but they let me go into the bathroom by myself, which was probably not a good idea. So, if you're listening out there, if you're if you're stopping yeah. really late, I mean, nothing. You know, he yeah. could, he, he followed me back out because I guess he was yeah. seeing he was gonna yeah, see got, if I was yeah, alone. You gotta, gotta watch bathrooms, man. Like the, a lot of uh, a lot of like yeah, weird shit happens in bathrooms. Well, luckily, luckily there was, there were, there was another person there. He didn't try anything in the bathroom, but when we were walking back outside, he followed me. So he was in the bathroom. He didn't go to the bathroom. He was just standing by the door. There was another person in the bathroom. Luckily I rushed out. The other person came out and then he followed, he, he followed me out, I guess, to see who I was with, because if I wasn't with anybody, he might've tried to, he might've tried to kidnap me. And this, this was when I was really young, so I couldn't fight him off. But Anyway, the point I was making with all that, I, I can go into more details in a more relevant podcast. But uh, and what's funny is I kind of forgot about those incidents for a lot of years until I started reading more about true crime cases. I was like, oh yeah, I had some close calls myself. But regarding the deserted streets and all those things, you want to keep your kids safe. So the next point I was to make is that humans they really like the illusion of safety. Not to turn this into a gun control topic, but I think that's one of the reasons. People want to kind of some people want to restrict all guns completely, make all guns illegal. So you're going to take the guns out of homeowners. I mean, old women, single mothers who can't really protect. I mean, how are they going to protect themselves against a gang of guys, even with no weapon? If like a gang of 10 men broke into their house, what are they going to do? You know, so I I don't know if taking the guns out of the hands of these, you know, defenseless, otherwise defenseless people, people that are too weak to fight people off. They need guns, but it's kind of like a knee-jerk reaction where they want the illusion of safety because it's almost like they pretend there's no black market. They pretend there's no criminals. They pretend that criminals follow laws so that nobody could get their hands on guns because that would be a good world where there were no mass weapons, you know, weapons that could kill so severely. That'd be nice, but that's fantasy. That'll never happen because there'll still be out people out there with knives, swords, battering rams, flaming torches, brass knuckles. I mean... You know, you can't really def- unless unless you're also one of those types of people, you're a fighter or a soldier, you're not going to be able to defend yourself without a gun. So these kind of emotional pleas or illusions of safety, I think that gets people too. So even like the John Benet Ramsey case, the book Perfect Murder Perfect Town, it's it's it, it's creepy when these small towns and neighborhoods that are really peaceful and idyllic, they're Americana, they're symbols of peace and freedom, and they're where you want your kids to grow up, the suburbs. And with all these true crime cases coming out where you have these predators and serial killers stalking people, killing people, abducting children, it's almost like nowhere is safe and the world is not safe. And a lot of people really want that 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 safety or the illusion of safety that they can never have. And I think that's also behind some of the morbid fascination with true crime, because some of these neighborhoods and towns, they're supposed to be peaceful and safe. They're not supposed to be the stomping ground of predators. So it's almost like the American dream gone wrong. And it's, uh, yeah, people just, they want, they, they can't figure it out. They can't wrap their head around it. And it's so, it's rough, you know, reading all these, reading about these cases, watching these documentaries about these cases, they kind of draw you in because it's almost like it's not supposed to be this way, but it is. And it's just very fascinating. Agree or disagree, Maxwell Powers? Uh, agreed. So, so yeah, I think those are the primary factors behind people's morbid curiosity, morbid fascination. The one last group of people that we haven't talked about, which is uh, very, very dark, are the people that have these urges and desires themselves. So would-be serial killers would, of course, be fascinated with other serial killers. Like, how did they get away with it? You know, uh, the ones that got caught. That's, that's, that's funny. I, like, I haven't really thought of that. Like, yeah, I can, the ones. I can, see, I can see, like, serial killers, like, binging on Netflix. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, also, <laughs> cr- if they're doing. crime stuff. Like, yeah, if they're. Like, to, too... learn, to learn from their plays and shit. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, I, can't make, I can't make that mistake. <laughs> yeah, so would-be serial killers are doing their research watching all these documentaries podcasts like how did these people get caught when they were successful how were they successful and just people and also i think more people who are just might have mental illnesses or 
in that in that i can i can also uh, i see a guy again or in that in that category where they're too scared to ever be a serial killer themselves so it's almost like they're vicariously like certain sick people they're vicariously living through real serial killers because they're too scared to kill anybody themselves so oh, yeah, and they, yeah, they don't want to do movies because movies are fake so they yeah. have to watch these documentaries where they get this thrill of killing i can, I can, I can see that happening it's kind of like kind of like uh with like fighters watching fights like you oh yeah yeah you yeah. can't you can't live out your fights because it's kind of like illegal or whatever or, or you know so you live out through the televised fights yeah some so, kind of vicarious yeah, thrill ride yeah. for people that yeah. want to be serial killers but they're too scared yeah so um, or they have too much of a conscience but their doc their dark side is dominating so they really want to they just they just don't so yeah, I mean, I think we covered a big spectrum of uh, a lot of different reasons, a lot of different people that are attracted to true crime for different reasons. But let's close the podcast out with this final thought. Where do you think that you, where do you see the trend going? Do you just see true crime becoming more and more popular? Because with the way the news is, with the way media is, I mean, everything's getting darker and darker. And the fear mongering vibe as we march towards a 1984 police state. What, what, what do you think? Um, I'm actually just this came to mind. This is kind of a it's a sick thing to think about, but uh, well, I'm not sure if this exists or anything, or and I'm not telling the murderers to think of it like this, but I'm I haven't seen like a, a documented blogger crime person, <laughs> like you know, like documenting his his kills on like I don't know that's sick. Like, yeah, that's like, really like, that, I, yeah, I can, that'd be I real. Can, that'd be see, really yeah, good. that'd be really sick. I can see like. Like let's say like uh, this this criminal sick psychopath like looking all the, at all these documentaries and trying to plan out his exit strategy where he like documents all his uh, crimes and then you know turns himself in and then publishes his thing and then becomes famous that kind of thing like I don't know it's just it's kind of sick but it's a sick thought <laughs> but I yeah I mean see, it's I it's, can see someone else yeah. someone doing that in the future somewhere. Well, statistically, it's bound to happen at some point if it hasn't already. I mean, there were serial killers who kind of filmed their own crimes. I don't know if they were thinking about turning it into a documentary or anything that crazy. They just, I mean, actually, a lot of serial killers film their crimes, I guess, to watch and relive it themselves, maybe. But uh, uh, yeah, I can see that. I guess that that's never reaches or that. You really know, what would be really what would audience. be really dark is a serial killer who has like a weekly podcast who documents his weekly kills. Oh my god! And that's then, dark. Like, like, yeah. well, of course he can't publish it right away. I guess, I guess he can, but if he he can, can if he, he tries, to, yeah, if he if he knows how to uh, mask himself and stuff. So, yeah, it's 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 really dark. But I think we covered the spectrum of a lot of different interest groups within true crime. So, do you think the genre is just going to be more and more popular as time goes on? Um, uh, I guess. Well, you got Stephen Avery pushing it right now. Um. Yeah, I mean, as more and more podcasts come up, more and more cases are covered. Unfortunately, more and more people are being killed and going missing. And uh, we, we have quite a few more podcast series, a lot more cases coming up. And there doesn't seem to be an end for these. Hopefully, cold cases can push to be, there could be a push. I mean, I was actually just thinking this earlier today while I was driving. If they If they pulled all of the speed trap cops in the country off of just trying to give catch people speeding and they put a lot of money and time and energy into educating them to become really good cold case researchers and cold case detectives how many cases could be solved ah, that's a that's a good idea i mean instead of building up their tax base yeah stealing off that stealing off the people like they can actually do something more not to mention i mean is there any evidence that is there any evidence that speeding tickets actually deter speeders i mean every time i go out there's people speeding um, like, I would I would say yes, but I mean because it's happened to me. <laughs> um, I mean, oh, you I used to I you used to I be a serial speeder. Um, I wasn't speeding on purpose. Like I don't I don't like speeding on purpose. Like because I'm not I'm not like it. But I've gotten two speed tickets. So like I rather than being unaware of like my my speed, I pay more attention to it. Like, oh, well, I'm like talking about going. the people that speed. Yeah, but the people that speed on purpose, they don't they don't care about the cop especially if they're rich and they don't care about the ticket. I mean, it doesn't really do anything. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like it, it's, wouldn't it, wouldn't resources be better allocated to trying to solve cold cases and bring closure to families? 
Yeah. Not to mention, if more cases could get solved, I think that would be a bigger deterrent to a certain percentage of would-be offenders because as a serial killer, I mean, obviously the completely insane serial killers, you can't stop them no matter what. Like, they have an urge to kill, and they're not going to stop. Some of them want to be in prison. Some of them kill themselves because they don't want to kill people. They just can't help it. They're just, that's their condition. But in the middle group of people, if if cold cases were more solvable, especially now with DNA evidence, uh, obviously there's a lot of problems with DNA evidence, but the general popular opinion is that DNA evidence is accurate and it does put a lot of people away. Obvious, unfortunately, a certain percentage of those people are innocent, but as DNA technology evolves, it, it's exposing the previous technology as inaccurate. And a lot of false positives the based on thresholds and all these things. that we, We've gone over those on DNA for Dummies on the Stephen Avery series. We're going to do a dedicated podcast on DNA evidence in general and the issues with DNA evidence. So we'll be going over that. But in general, it seems like it's harder and harder to get away with killing people because of all of the... I mean, we live in a surveillance state now. I mean, there's videos everywhere. DNA evidence, phone tracking. I mean, it's just harder to get away with it now. But obviously certain people are still doing it. And the uh, we went over stats. I mean, I think something like 60% of homicides remain unsolved. So those are not good statistics. I mean, that is not a display of competence by law enforcement. So if they really allocated a lot of re resources into solving cases, not just cold cases, but homicides, you know, pull off every single speed trap officer. Pull off every officer arresting people for growing certain plants or collecting rainwater or whatever nonsense is going on that police are arresting people for. If you pool all those resources, get really good education for, for these officers to become cold case detectives, I think a lot more cases could be solved and are solvable. And, of course, the victims of these crimes and their families, they deserve closure and justice. So more could be done to get that. Any final thoughts, Maxwell? The future of true crime? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that should be on your next mug. I yeah. don't know. Um, well, I was, I was thinking when, when you mentioned that, I was thinking about, like, is there is there a point of uh, diminishing returns as far as, like, people trying to solve, like, cases? Like, if there, if there are too many cops, too many officers, like, working the same case, I don't know. Is there, is there like, a... Oh, I'm sure. Uh, like a diminishing not, there, there, on, there might like, be, but there's so many cases out there. You can just have one one cop per case. I mean, there's there's thousands of missing persons cases. There's thousands of cold cases, if not tens of thousands. I mean, so yeah, no, there's there's. Uh, I don't not not to mention everybody. Like we talked about, we've talked about this before in other podcasts on how different people bring different skill sets or opinions to the table. We, we talked about this in our online sleuths podcast on how the more, you know, two heads are better than one, three heads are better than two. So I don't know about that diminishing returns. I mean, in ter if you're only looking at numbers of cases being solved per amount of officers working per the paycheck that they draw, I'm sure you can find diminishing returns. But if it's bringing closure to the family of a victim, I mean, are you going to say it wasn't worth it? I mean, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. But I'm sure there's an optimal setup but anyway, we hope you enjoyed another edition of Mind Shock True Crime. If you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, hit the like button. Feel free to share it across social media platforms. Any questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions, leave them in the comments section. Like our Facebook page. You can also check us out. Twitter, Reddit, Patreon. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Maxwell Powers. We'll catch you guys next time.